Hi everybody. It's good to be back here on the camera with all of you again. As you've noticed, uh, I haven't really been posting a lot of videos lately. And really in the last couple of weeks, I have not really had any time to even start any new projects on the bench. Things both at work and at home have been very busy lately, but it's been a good kind of busy. We've been uh, doing a whole lot of things at work. And I actually have a bunch of pictures and a couple little short video clips from work that I may compose into another one of my random videos and kind of give you just a little talk on some x-ray things. If you're interested, let me know down in the comments section if you're interested in hearing some things. Just uh, some old technology x-ray equipment that uh, I didn't even realize was still around because most of the older equipment from the 70s and the 80s has been removed and is no longer in service anywhere. But uh, just went through a lot of my old photos and things and found some things that might be interesting. Second of all, I did start a video quite some time ago, probably several months ago, and it's another capacitor related video, as if you need to hear any more about capacitors. But uh, it's not, it wasn't completed. I never completed the video. It's not been edited. And what I'm going to try to do is kind of put it together, and put it at the end of this video, at least to have something for you to watch here. And uh, I'll try to annotate some of it to make a little more sense of things. So we'll talk about that at the end of the video. The other thing I want to bring up is if any of you have had a chance to read through the comments section on the preamp video we did on that SAE preamp that had the equalizer in it, I asked all of you to give me your opinions and thoughts about the use of graphic equalizers. And I was stunned by how many of you commented and how many good comments I got both for using a equalizer and against it as well. And a lot of the things I had never even thought of, uh, one, just for a couple, couple ideas, I had several people comment that uh, they were hard of hearing. And I am too, to a degree, not terribly like some people, and some of my relatives may be right now, but at about eight kilohertz, uh, the last hearing test I had, the you know, my hearing starts to drop off a little bit. And by the time I'm somewhere around 14 kilohertz, it's pretty much gone. And, you know, when you, when you get up into your 50s and closer into your 60s, whatever, that's pretty common. It can happen. Not to everybody, but to a lot of us, especially when you're in an environment where there's a lot of loud noises and you haven't necessarily protected your ears like you should have, and which I'm guilty of, of course. Uh, so... And the, they find the use of an equalizer actually helps them. I can see that. And, uh, but for me, I don't know, let me know your thoughts. But when I crank up some of the higher frequencies, it doesn't necessarily, I may not still hear those frequencies. They may not be that loud. But regardless, what I find is that even though they're playing in the background and I'm not hearing them, having those amplified higher frequencies will actually give give me ear fatigue. I'll actually get fatigued from listening to it, even though I'm not really hearing those frequencies. The other thing I notice is the frequency that I can hear, you know, the little bit lower in that 8 to 10 kilohertz range, they tend to sound a lot more shrill in my ear. So I'm not a big fan of the tone control strict, simply because of how it affects my personal hearing. Another thing I want to talk about, other than the equalizers, oh, and you know, another thing on equalizers, a lot of people like the, the flat sound. They, they don't like the sound to be colored from what it originally was. And I have so many thoughts about that. I could do an entire video on that. But uh, that leads me to my next comment, and that is audio in general. You know, we, we hear the word audio file, and you notice in my past videos, I shy away from that word because I, to call some, you know, it, it, it can have so many meanings to so many people what that word means. But really, an audio enthusiast, people who love to listen 
to good quality sound systems and to music and to so recordings and so forth. There's so many different directions you can go with it. But my personal take on it is I really am on the fence about accurate sound. I know that the ultimate goal is to be able to listen to a recording exactly the way it was recorded or at least the way that the recording artist and the recording engineer who recorded it wanted it to sound. But really, what happens when we get into the mud with that? Well, if you go back to the 1950s and 1940s, recording techniques were a lot different. And the equipment that you played those recordings back on and listened to them on were a lot different. And that sound was a sound all its own. And if you play something recorded in that era that was intended to be listened to on equipment from that era, it's going to sound very different on a modern, very high-end, very high-dollar sound system. So I'm not really so sure what the perfect audio system would be for me, other than a lot of different audio systems, depending on what you're listening to. For me, good audio is more of an experience than it is uh, a science. And what I mean by that is when I was young and going out with my cousin repairing jukeboxes out in the nightclubs and things in the bars, the sound that we heard, and when we go back to the shop at night to drop off the, the, the work car and you know pick up his personal car, the sounds that I heard from those jukeboxes were just about as far away from high-end audio as you could get because it didn't sound like a very expensive home audio system. You know, anybody that's heard an older jukebox knows what I'm talking about. But I associate the music that I heard on those jukeboxes with the experience of being with my, my cousin, with my family, uh, learning new things about how the equipment works, servicing it and so forth. So to me, it's a whole new experience when I listen to something. Uh, it's it's its whole whole individual experience, I should say, when I listen to a certain song in a certain way. So when I hear like an older style vacuum tube amplifier, for instance, some of those don't have the greatest sound on earth if you try to gauge it by technology and, and by by numbers and measurements and distortion and all that. But it has a sound that brings back memories that you may have experienced. So to me, you know, some people, even listening to a song on a, on a boombox, you know, on a portable radio or something, as poor as those can sound compared to a, you know, multi-thousand dollar sound system, listening to a certain song on that type of equipment brings back memories. So it may be a pleasant sound for you to listen to, and would sound absolutely horrid to other people. So I guess my point that I'm making is sound systems are a very personal thing. And to call yourself an audiophile, like to be an authority on it, it, to me is kind of a stretch because really it's so personal and individual to each person that when you're listening to something, it's going to be a different experience for each person listening. You know, I can put a sound system, bring somebody over to something that I think sounds wonderful, and somebody else can listen to it and say, I don't like that, you know, and, and vice versa, too. So to me, there is no right or wrong answer. And when I do repairs on the bench of equipment for, for other people, uh, and I don't do a lot of that now because I obviously don't have the time, but when I am working on something that's somebody else's personal equipment, I really want to take that into account. Uh, what they like because I'm not going to change something or do something to that sound system that is going to affect the way they like to hear it and that's very important you know whenever you're doing work for another person that involves sound like that you definitely want to know what it is they're looking for what they like so that's just my little personal uh, comments on on sound and and on I'm saying all this just because of how many comments I got on that preamp video. They were just wonderful. I, I really enjoyed the conversation that everybody had. That's my little tiny worthless two cents worth <laughs> of my opinion. 
but uh, I really appreciate you all participating. You know, reading those comments and, and getting the emails from all of you, it's really a special thing for me because after a real busy day at work or whatever, um, something going on, it's just so relaxing to read some, read some comments and interact with other people who have similar interests to myself. And uh, I, that's the whole reason I do this, guys, is not is for you and also for me. You know, what I get from you is just as valuable as what you claim that you get from me when I make these videos. So I thank you all for that. I really appreciate it. I can't say that enough. I know I've said it. I sound like a broken record, no pun intended, but I do appreciate all of you. So anyway, I'm going to put this little kind of cobbled together video at the end here and at least it'll give you something to watch hopefully it will tide you over a little bit uh, what i think i'm going to do next and it may take me another week before i can free up the time to do it is i have a really nice old very rare from what i can see fisher am80 it's an am tuner it's a component piece very old and uh it looks like it's going to be a really interesting project. There's nothing special about it, but it is a pretty good quality tuner. I'm going to do a restoration on that. And then what I'm probably going to do, I kind of discussed this with my friend who procures a lot of this cool gear for me. I told him I think what I want to do is design just a very simple vacuum tube mono amplifier to go with this thing. I'm going to make a little component amplifier with maybe a built-in speaker so that we can listen to that AM80 tuner through a vacuum tube amplifier. Nothing special, nothing super high fidelity because it's, it's an AM tuner and I think it will be a fun project for us to do and it'll be something I can break up into a couple of a few parts uh, that I may have a little more time to work with because like I said for the next uh, maybe month or a couple weeks or a month, I'm going to be pretty busy and I'm not going to have enough time to, to kind of devote to, to working on the bench here, except for in little, little bits and pieces. So I'm glad I was able to get this little video out here. I'm going to get it uploaded and posted for you. And I wish you all well. And as always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. I hope everything's going well for all of you, and I look forward to making more videos for you shortly. So I have a question that comes up pretty often, and it goes something like this, and this is in the questions and comments on a lot of my videos, including the last few that I did. And it goes something like this. This capacitor here, if it's an electrolytic capacitor, and I say that electrolytic capacitors cannot pass AC current, how, can it, how is it that they can be used as a decoupling cap to the load? Obviously you can see the output here is alternating current, AC. It's going positive of the, of the zero point and negative of the zero point. Well, we're going to explain that a little bit by doing a little bit of a demonstration. So if you look at this right here, in a typical class A amplifier, you can see that you have your voltage up here, your VCC, and you have ground or zero volts down here. And somehow we're producing an AC signal here. How are we doing that? Now the first thing we talk about is bias. And we do, when we do the bias adjustment, we're turning these transistors on part way. And what we're doing is we're going to adjust them about halfway through their voltage. So if this is 10 volts, we're going to set this point to be around 5 volts, if that makes sense. And I'm oversimplifying this just to make it a little easier to understand. And then as we apply our signal input, this voltage will go up and down from that 5 volts. It'll go from the 5 up to the 10 volts, and it'll go from 5 down to the 0 volts. And that's what gives us our output. But what's really happening here? Is this truly AC or is this DC? Well, really, the answer to the question is where you are looking at the signal. If we're taking our measurement with our oscilloscope right here, it never crosses the zero point. In other words, 
this voltage will never go below zero volts. This will never go more negative than zero volts. It will always stay positive with respect to this rail here. They will never change places. This will always be a positive voltage. Even if it's just slightly above zero volts <laughs> or all the way to VCC, it will always be a positive voltage. But after it gets through this capacitor, it will not be a positive, it will be an alternating current. How can that be? We're going to do a little setup and we're going to demonstrate it. Here's a little schematic of the little circuit that we're going to build that's going to be the equivalent of our transistor circuit. So this re variable resistor is going to act like our transistors and it can take the voltage and adjust it between VCC and ground. This coupling capacitor will represent the, the cap that comes out of the transistors and into our speaker which is this be represented by this little resistor right here. And we're going to see just in slow motion, just like your amplifier, when this voltage varies, what happens to our load. And we're going to look at, we're going to measure the voltage across the capacitor from here to here. And we're going to measure the signal across the speaker right here. So we're going to use our voltmeter to measure this voltage across the capacitor. And we're going to use the oscilloscope to monitor the waveform. Here's our variable resistor. Yeah, it's huge. It's a 300 ohm, 300 watt resistor. And, or 500 ohm, I'm sorry. And we have our power supply connected here with 10 volts. So we have 10 volts between here and here, which represents this right here. And then the wiper of the, of the variable rheostat is going to come out of here and go into our capacitor. It's going to come out of the capacitor and through my little resistance box, which represents our speaker. And you can see these, the white and black leads, these go up to the voltmeter. So we're reading across the capacitor. And then this is our speaker load here. And you can see the oscilloscope connected across there. So let's go up to the meter and take a look. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to vary this up and down. As you can see right now, we have our bias voltage, we're going to call this, set at 5 volts. So the capacitor is actually charged up to 5 volts. How is that right now? Well, here's how it works. And I'm going to hold this, I'll try to hold it still. When you apply this voltage here, part of the voltage will go down to here to, to ground through the resistor. And then part of it will divide, this becomes like a voltage divider at this wiper here, will go through the capacitor and find its path to ground. And this capacitor will charge to ground. So the electrons will come up here and they will charge this plate. Okay. And what's going to happen is this capacitor will charge up and then it will sit there at that bias voltage. But since it's charged, there will be no current flowing. In other words, once this potential reaches, reaches its charge and this potential reaches its charge, it's going to go to rest and there's not going to be any current flow and there will be zero volts right here and zero amps. The only time it will change is when we vary the voltage. Now when we go up, what's going to happen is the capacitor will have to charge more and the electrons will need to get up into the capacitor so there will be current flow in this direction. If I turn this down then the voltage here will be more negative than it is here so this capacitor will have to lose some electrons through this direction and it's actually going to cause current to flow in the opposite direction. So you can see it's going to give up some electrons. So you have a back and forth motion of the capacitor charging through the resistor and discharging through the resistor, if that makes any sense. So watch what happens. We're now sitting at 5 volts. Here's the scale, right? There's 5 volts, 10 volts, 15 volts. We're on the 15 volt scale. And we have roughly 0 volts sitting there right now. Now the teeny little bit of 
current flow that you see on the oscilloscope right now is due to the fact that we have we don't have a perfect capacitor the capacitor has some leakage on it and so because there is a load there and because the capacitor has inherent leakage and all those things there's a teeny tiny little bit of leakage that's always there but it's almost zero now watch what happens when I turn the voltage up now we're gonna go from 5 volts up so this needle will go up and what's happening to that signal now and you can see as I turn the voltage up the capacitor charged and now it's discharging back down through that resistor if I turn if I change that resistance so let's say I go to 500 ohms you can see it discharges a lot faster let's go back so we're back to 5 volts right let's go back up now I have 500 ohms and you can see what happens as I go up now when I go down how about that it actually goes below zero volts do you see that so let's pretend we're putting a signal on here an AC sine wave let's say so let's set this to 5 volts and I'm gonna go above and below 5 volts just like a sine wave watch what do you see look familiar of course I'm not turning the pot very smoothly but it's actually going above and below zero volts this is zero volts right here in the center of the screen and you notice it's going negative and positive positive. and the reason it's doing that is the power supply is never going negative the power supply is always staying above zero volts in other words the polarity never changes here so what we have is a changing DC signal now we refer to that as an offset signal an offset for instance if we put a sine wave this is a offset sine wave but it is not alternating current because it does not alternate the polarity the polarity stays the same however on this capacitor because this capacitor holds that charge and it's charging and discharging back and forth so this voltage is going up the current flows one direction when the voltage goes down the current flows the other direction because the only current path for this capacitor is through the load so the load is actually seeing an alternating current depending on whether you're charging this cap or discharging this cap so this is not passing an AC <laughs> as per se but with reference to this load it is an alternating signal if that makes sense so we're really not breaking the rule of having a capacitor uh, electrolytic polarized capacitor